Hi everybody, a warm welcome to a new webinar series on research management that is being brought to you by the DBT Wellcome Trust India Alliance. Um, a few housekeeping matters before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and so if any of your colleagues miss out on today's session, they can always follow the webinar through the recordings that will become available through the India Alliance channels. Um, you can leave questions anytime during the, the webinar in the questions box and uh, we will have time to answer those questions. For any reason, in case the webinar ends abruptly due to a technical glitch, please join back using the registration link uh, that you use to join at this point. And uh, so on that note, I'd just like to share a few things about ERMI, the India Research Management Initiative. ERMI was instituted in 2019 with the aim of strengthening research ecosystems in India. And I'd just like to draw your attention to that lovely banner there on the slide. This has been created to be representative of research management, which is conducted through professionals who often have to work across boundaries to facilitate research. So more about ERMI, you could read about ERMI on the India Alliance website. And I'd just like to share the ERMI strategic priorities for the period 2019 to 2024. We have four strategic priorities. The first one is to support research centers in India and in strengthening their research management services, which are available to their researchers. The second priority is supporting training, career development, and networking opportunities for research managers and administrators. The third priority is building national and international partnerships for knowledge and resource exchange in the field of research management. And the fourth strategic priority for ERMI is creating a community of practice for research management in India. And again, you can read more details about the ERMI strategic priorities on the India Alliance website. There's a URL on the slide there. Um, and uh, which brings us to today's edition of the webinar series, the first edition of this webinar series, which is focused on the role of a central research office in facilitating research. And it's wonderful that we're being joined by three experts today who are going to present perspectives from three different countries. So we have Simon Kerridge, Director of Research Services from the University of Kent in the UK. We have Katrina Lawson, who's joining us from Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And we have Vinita Raghavan, who's joining us from Bangalore here in India. And so today, through the eyes of Simon, Katrina and Vinita, we hope you'll get a very nice view of what a research office is meant to facilitate and what the journey in building and sustaining a research office might look like. So on that note, I'd like to invite our first speaker for this afternoon, Simon Kerridge, to make his presentation. And uh, while we're waiting for that to happen, there's a small audience poll that we'd just like to go through with. So please take a few minutes and answer these questions because this will help uh, our uh, speakers have a snapshot of what the audience is like today. Uh, so, Savita, just to say, um, with the poll open, I can't start the presentation, which is fine. I'm just telling you that's why I've not started. All right, that's fine, Sam. So it looks like about a third of our participants today are research managers, which is great. And also a third of our participants are students or postdocs, um, perhaps individuals who are considering careers in research management or are just curious about what makes um, this part of the ecosystem work. So 
on that note. We will close the poll and uh, we'll move on to Simon's presentation. Okay, great. So can, can you see my slide, my first slide? Uh, we can see the presenter view. Ah, it's happened again. Excellent. I'm glad I asked. Thank you very much. How's that? Better. Great. Okay, and I've stolen half of my uh, first minute anyway. Okay, great. So, um, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I will talk about uh, these things here. The first one, my favourite subject, which is myself, uh, my university, um, and then my research office, and then a little bit about the the roles and also the characteristics of of research managers and administrators. Um, the slides are going to be available afterwards, so I'm not going to cover necessarily everything on them, um, but hopefully uh, sufficient to keep you interested and awake. So. Um, just some contact details for me if you need them, if you have any follow-up questions afterwards uh, that you don't get to ask during the session itself. Um, so uh, here is me. Um, for those of you who perhaps haven't got me on the screen, that's what I look like, at least in my mind, that's what I look like. Um, there's, there's my four dogs who, who keep me sane, and there's a, a number of things uh, that I'm involved in to just sort of give you my credentials, if you like. Um, I suppose the thing I should also mention is that I have done some work with Savita on on ERMI in terms of evaluation of things, so I, I know a little bit about uh, what's what's happening. Um, that's what I actually look like, and now having heard my voice, I'm pretty sure that this is the image that you would have had in your mind if you hadn't seen the other photos. Certainly, that's what my wife seems to think I look like. So the university then, uh, we're uh, based in the southeast of, uh, of England. Um, we have campuses across the UK and also in, in continental Europe. So you've got Paris, Athens and Rome there, always nice to visit. There's a few stats uh, down uh, the, uh, the, the right hand side of the slide and I'll reflect on those later on when we compare the size of the research office. Uh, we have graduates, there I am, the red dot, and if you don't know where England is, um, th there it is, and you can see it's uh, not far away from India as you might have thought, it's only a quarter of the way around the world. Uh, so what is the, the remit of research services at Kent? I mean, we have two main roles, it's to support the strategic vision of the university, uh, but then also to support individual academics, um, specifically uh, to do with funding opportunities, getting those proposals in, getting them awarded and, and, and looking after them. Um, th there's a few sort of details there, probably uh, well, this slide is easier to absorb. So we monitor uh, developments in the research funding environment. So across uh, the UK for national funding, across Europe for European funding, uh, and internationally uh, for, for international funding opportunities. Not just looking at funding opportunities, but also the, the sort of the policy initiative. So, so what might be happening next? So the UK, for example, now has quite a large uh, global challenges uh, fund, and it's knowing about that before it starts so that we're, we're ready to support academic staff. Um, that leads on to that uh, leading the university in, in research funding. So not only do we have the ideas about where those opportunities might be going to be coming, we then support staff in, in applying for those and, and managing those grants. So it's, as I say, it's, it's that dual role. Um, we're organised, I've, I've got a chart later on, but into these sort of three main chunks. So, as I say, identifying uh, funders and helping with the proposal application, doing the costing and pricing, making sure we ask for the right amount of money, um, having that institutional sign off, accepting and negotiating the award, um, dealing with uh, IP issues and so on actually then managing the award, uh, particularly from the financial side of things. And then afterwards there are claims and then end of award reports and then potentially uh, reporting to the funders after the end of the award as well. Um, in the pink on the right hand side, there are sort of uh, additional things if you do along the side, which I'll, I'll cover on the, on the next slide. Um, so that, that main chunk down the middle is, is what I've really talked about. It's that, that information, the funding opportunities, the, the background news and the policy. So not only what is the funding opportunity, 
uh, but what is you need to put in your proposal to persuade the funders uh, that you are meeting their objectives with your piece of research? What's that underlying policy they're trying to achieve? Uh, we do lots of facilitation, putting academic staff together so they can come up with interdisciplinary ideas. That's the, that's the sand pit. And actually then helping with the applications, making sure that uh, they're understandable. Uh, you know, if anyone's written anything uh, after you've written it 10 times, you, you then can't see those errors in it. You, you become word blind to that. And as I say, managing the awards. On, on the right hand side in the box, there are also those things outside the project of a particular, uh, outside the life cycle of a particular project. So that research governance, the research strategy, uh, governance and ethics, um, the overarching planning and processes for how does the university process things? We, we create all those processes. We also look at key performance indicators. So for example, research income or publication citations. Uh, in the UK, we also have a thing called the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, um, which is a very large multi-annual exercise. Every six or seven years or so, we submit information to the, uh, the national government saying, this is the research we've done over the last period. Uh, and they then award us funding uh, for that for the following six or seven years. And for Kent, that's worth about 100 million pounds. Um, so it's it's quite a big exercise. Um, we also have uh, a scholarly communications office joint uh, with our library. So that's um, very useful when looking at uh, the outputs of research and, and how you might better improve them. Um, so I, I said I'd talk about the sort of the sizes just to give you an idea. Uh, Kent has about 700 academic staff and about 150 researchers on top of that. Uh, we're mainly social sciences, uh, but we also have a quarter of the sciences and a quarter of arts and humanities, just to give you an idea of the split. Roughly 12% of our, of our income is research, which is average across the UK. Some institutions have a lot more, some institutions have a lot less. Um, and that's about 600 live projects. Um, and that amounts to about uh, 20 million pounds worth of, of income a year. Um, in order to manage and support that, you'll see on the right-hand side, uh, research services, which I look after, has around 25 staff. We also have an additional 25 staff in a different office looking at uh, supporting innovation and enterprise, so working with, with companies. And you can see the split in the different areas. So research development is the people helping with proposals. Costing and contracts is getting the proposal submitted and negotiating them. The accounts is, is the post-award stuff. And then you, you can see again, REF there reporting key performance indicators and research systems is around five staff. We have an ethics and, and governance uh, manager and we have two people who are supporting that scholarly communications. What is it that you can do to make your publications easier to find? So open access is a big thing at the moment. Um, this is the structure of, of research services with those, those 25 staff. Um, so uh, we've got the first column on the left hand side is, is the funding team, um, grants and contracts in the middle and then the, the accounts team. And then right on the right hand side, that smaller chunk is, uh, is, is research excellence and information. Um, just to give you an idea of, of where all these people came from, um, we've got a number of people who were previously research managers and administrators elsewhere in research services. So if you like, these are internal promotions. We have people who've moved elsewhere from the university. So um, either from a, a different department or from a faculty. Um, we have people who have come from elsewhere in, in the sector. So moved from other institutions, but all from a research management background. Uh, we have uh, people who've moved from funders to the university. Uh, and we always like to try and attract people who've worked in a funder because they've got a lot of inside knowledge. Most of the accounts team have come from a finance background. Um, other people have moved from other parts of administration in the institution. And we also have people who've previously been researchers. And most often you get those in that funding in the pre-award side of things. Um, and then you get people from other backgrounds, which are too numerous to mention. Um, of course, that's just their previous job. Looking back a bit further, uh, that particular person before being uh, promoted had worked in a funder. So that's that green box there. And this person had worked from an, in another institution and this person had been a researcher before and and so on and lots of different you know, histories so it's quite interesting to look at that um, to see the sort of breadth of background that you might want from people that you might want to employ. Um, in the UK we have uh, an association of research managers and administrators there are about three three thousand members altogether and you can see that, that growth over time and the sort of things that the association do are an annual conference and then you can see 
training seminars, expert seminars like this one, uh, special interest groups, uh, study tours to funders, we had some mentoring program, and there are also uh, internal publications uh, about research management and administration. Um, I should also highlight the, the largest international conference for research managers and administrators, which will be happening in, uh, in, INORMS, uh, in INORMS in Hiroshima in 2021. Um, there's a big report which is not out yet, it will be coming out uh, next month in fact and has a lot of information. I'll just highlight a couple of things. Minute Two minutes, yeah, yeah, half a minute, okay. Uh, so uh, you can see here um, that uh, if you can see my mouse, we have uh, a large proportion of uh, research offices look after pre-award, but sometimes it's done in a different office, which is the orange area, um, and sometimes it's there is no formal res responsibility for this area because perhaps it's done by faculties. So uh, pre-award very very often done in 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 the research office. Similarly, the support for this REF uh, and the policy and the strategy almost always done in the research office. Um, if you want to look at this slide later on, you can see the different areas and where it's normally done in the central office, where it's normally done in conjunction, and over here where it's quite often done elsewhere. So things like publish engage, public engagement and uh, graduate school stuff is quite often done elsewhere. Um, a little bit about uh, research managers. Quite often um, uh, they are uh, female. Um, so in the UK, for example, we have 78% of research managers and administrators are female. It's a very female-oriented profession. You can see some people have been uh, in the profession for nearly 40 years, so that's kind of how old it is. Um, very qualified, uh, over a quarter have doctorates, over three quarters have a doctorate or a master's, which is the orange chunk there. Um, and this chunk here, this is where do they work? So universities around there. Uh, we also have a lot who work in research institutes, but also in hospitals, in research funders, in charities, um, and, and, and so on. So it's not just within universities. I think I've used all of my time, so I will finish with the, um, the role of research offices to strategically support research Almost always we want to increase the volume of research and the quality of it, uh, but we're also here to be the policeman, if you like, to, to make sure that we have adequate governance, but also that research is sustainable so we get enough funding for it uh, and th that we can be accountable. It's usually public funding and we act in an equitable way. Uh, we do all of that by uh, promoting the research opportunities, by showing good practice, exchanging good practice. Um, thinking about the outreach and the impact that our research has, so that public engagement, if you like, uh, and being open. Um, in terms of the research management staff, we need to be flexible and proactive and solve problems, not not get in the way. So we're not really policemen, um, uh, friendly, uh, authoritative, and, and of course, humorous. And I, I think I would sum that up with, we provide a service, but we're not subservient. We are adding value uh, and every member of academic staff will tell you that they're very glad to receive our help because it increases their chances of success. And I went over questions and discussion later. Sorry, Savita. Thank you so much, Simon. That was a really, really great introduction to uh, what happens at Kent and also what a central office is meant to do. Um, so on that note, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Katrina Lawson. Katrina has made Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam her home for the last several years. Um, and uh, she led the creation of the grant service at her institution. So it's a pleasure to welcome Katrina and we'd love to hear about uh, her journey in creating the grant service at Oxford University Clinical Research Unit at Vietnam. Uh, thank you, Zavita. Um, so first, just check that everybody can actually see my slides okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so my name's Katrina Lawson, as Savita said, and I'm a grants manager. Well, actually, I'm a grants and communications manager. I work at Oxford University Clinical Research Unit, which is a large-scale research unit in Vietnam. And our territory covers a bit more than Vietnam, actually. I support uh, four major sites in so two in Vietnam, one in Nepal, and one in Indonesia. My career in research support, um, it starts off with me, I did a BA in philosophy. I did, I'm not a researcher. I don't have PhD. I don't even have a master's degree. And I, and my first jobs in my career, in fact, were communications-based jobs. And I say this because I think 
as Simon also mentioned, there's lots of ways that you can get into the career of research management. But also, this, I think the skills that I learned doing my BA in philosophy and doing my communications work have been extraordinarily useful in my research management career. And they're part of the reason why I've had such a successful career. I started working in research management in 2005 in the University of Auckland. You might be able to tell from my accent that I'm a New Zealander. Um, I started off working as a research assistant on a research project. I did editorial work on a magazine. I became a contracts manager, managing grants from cradle to grave grants management um, and ended my, my work there. Um, by the time I left the University of Auckland, I was working as a business development manager at the Liggins Institute, which is a large scale research institute from the university. Um, and then I came to Vietnam because my husband got a job here. And I think a lot of people's careers take paths like this for different reasons. You know, in my career, I contributed to a lot of different projects. Um, but when I came to Vietnam, that's me riding my motorbike. In 2011, what I was told by recruiters when I arrived early in that year was, your career does not develop here. That was a, a quote from an email I got from a recruitment agency. They looked at my CV and they couldn't figure out what to do with me. They didn't think that any such job existed in this country. And I think that they're probably right, it didn't. But luckily for me, I managed to find out about our crew and get in touch with them. And we began having discussions about how to set up a local grants management service with Oak Crew, which is where I work now. So Oxford University Clinical Research Unit is, like I said, it's a large scale clinical research unit. And if you can see my arrow, it, we're working in three different countries and four major um, site offices. We're mostly Wellcome Trust funded, and we're also part of the University of Oxford. So we have a parent with the University of Oxford, but most of our work is actually um, managed. The administration of our units are very local, and the nexus of activity is really within Ho Chi Minh City. Our vision is to have local, regional, and global impact on health by leading a locally driven research program on infectious diseases in Southeast Asia. For me, the key words there are impact. We need to be able to record and report our impact. Um, and locally driven, we need to develop local capacity and that is with the researchers as well as with the research support. So there's some more information on the next slides about each of the sites that we work in. Um, and I won't go into all of that detail, but there's a few photos you can see as I scroll through. We started in 1991 and across all of the sites, we have over 400 research staff now. Our annual turnover is, I'm not sure of the exact figure actually, but we have a large block fund from the Wellcome Trust and with grants turnover alone, I think last year was something like 16 million pounds and then a large block fund on top of that. So I think we're looking at around 20 million or tw between 20 and 25 million pounds per year in research. Um, um, funding. Our grants team, I'm the grants manager. I have one local grants officer and another assistant grants officer um, who works part time. So there's only a very small team actually managing quite a large volume of applications and grants. But we also do get support from Oxford grants and contracts team because a lot of the all of our grants go through, ultimately go through Oxford. Um, basically, we do all the work and then they get set up on Oxford systems. They probably won't appreciate me describing it like that, but that's how I see it. Um, the grant support that we have, it, that we provide in our grants team is we provide a lot of support around opportunities, um, letting people know about what grants opportunities are out there that they can apply to. We do all the costing and pricing um, which gets complicated because really all of our work is collaborative and often multi-country collaborative projects. Uh, compliance is a big issue for us, uh, particularly with supporting compliance and due diligence for our local partners who are often um, have a lot less experience than some of the more 
the um, international partners from really well established international universities. There's a lot of writing support and that's particularly valuable for researchers at all stages of their career but especially I think the more junior researchers, um, students and people for whom English is not their first language. Um, we, we have approval processes and we guide applications through those approval processes. We work closely with Oxford and do quite a lot of work for Oxford that the PI doesn't really get involved in at all. I think that's a good service that we manage to provide by keeping that quite invisible to the PI. And we do a lot of, you know, coaching, training, preparing people for interviews, that sort of thing. This, that was all mostly pre-award work. Post-award, we do also provide support. Um, so for example, if something is, is there's a change in a contract or a, or a grant, uh, we need to obviously do set up, down grounds, negotiations with sub-awardees, that sort of thing. So as, as I said, you know, we worked to set up a grants um, function. So we started this in, 2011 and I just want to quickly take you through some of the things we did. The first thing we did was we created a database of all our applications and funding opportunities and I know there's a lot of talk about electronic research administration. I want to let you know that it doesn't have to be a super expensive electronic research administration system that costs a squillion dollars. We do it with Excel database. We've been doing it with an Excel database for coming up for 10 years now. Um, we have a, a shared OneNote drive. We have a filing system that's shared files that we can all access. Um, for the for the opportunities database, again, it's it's an Excel spreadsheet. We we collaborate with sister units in um, Thailand as well to gather these opportunities that are appropriate for our researchers. And we share it by email with our staff. It's probably one of the most important services that we actually do because it makes people come to us and work with us because they always want to want to know that we're looking out for opportunities for them. Um, the second thing is making an application and approval process, documenting it, and sharing it, and making sure that it's communicated. This is ours. You can see it on the slides later if you want to. Um, and it's a really important fundamental document for how our office operates. Again, training, skills development for the researchers as well as, sorry, as well as for the, um, for the research support staff. So costing and pricing, these are some of the trainings I've done. I have a two day grant writing workshop that involves quite a lot of zombies, plagiarism, um, auditing and financial administration, welcome trust terms and conditions. We've created a number of documents about, um, you know, Katrina, a specific minute left. aspects. Sorry? A minute left. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Got it. <laughs> okay. Um, then the next most important thing I think is around figuring out the roles and responsibilities and also separating from finance. So I think that a lot of you will be in a similar situation where with grants management, you know, the PIs are doing all the grants management or and the finance team might be doing the rest of it. So especially transactional stuff and financial reporting. We, we wanted to separate the grants management from the finance team to make sure that the finance team could do what they're good at, which is financial transactions, financial reporting and auditing. The researchers can do what they're good at, which is the research and the grants team and the other research support people are doing things to support the research. And one of the things that we did, so here's an example of one of our processes. We look at what happens after a grant is awarded and then go through and figure out who, what tasks actually need to happen to get a grant up and running and who does what roles. So sometimes it's the grants team, sometimes it's finance, sometimes it's the PI, sometimes it's Oxford. Making that really clear and communicating it is probably one of the very important things we've done. And finally, celebrating success. So for us, a very simple indicator of success is the number of grant applications has increased more than triple in the last um, nine, 10 years. Uh, the diversity of our grants has really grown, so has the value of grant income that has come in over that period of time. 
Uh, we celebrate Research Administrator Day. Here's some photos from previous Research Administrator Day events. Um, I believe really strongly that we need to develop research support capacity and we need to do that with high quality centralized support and you know wherever you have for example building capacity building activities into a grant application um, I think that you should include funding for research support as well. I wanted to just tell you one small story so in 2016 at the INORMS conference when I was there I noticed that there were a bunch of people from Southeast Asia at that conference. There's no armour for Southeast Asia. Um, we have, what I did was I, I immediately set up a Facebook group on my phone. I went around and I talked to people who were at that, that conference that I spotted that were from Asian countries. And we, by the end of the conference, we had about 15 people join the group. Now we have more than 100. And that's a, another sort of free networking way to kind of build the capacity locally. Uh, my final point that I want to say, this is a message from one of our researchers to the research support staff during our Research Administrator Day event. Uh, they said, you are as important to research as research is to science. And I think that that is really true. I agree with that. So thank you, everybody. Um, my slides will be available and my email address is on the first slide. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was a great talk. Um, and now I'd like to request Vinita Raghavan to share her story about the office that she heads currently in Bangalore. Vinita, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, am I visible yet? Okay, can you all see me see my slides? Yes. Okay, uh, great. So, uh, so from Vietnam to India, and I'll talk about the story of research management in India and the story of the Bangalore Life Science Cluster, uh, at, uh, of the RDO at the Bangalore Life Science Cluster. Uh, begin with a, a bit of introduction about myself and the campus that I represent. So my career, career trajectory started from academia and I did my PhD from ICGP New Delhi and moved on to the US for a couple of postdoctoral training uh, in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and uh, Yale University of School of Medicine. And then at six years of postdoctoral training, I moved to India at which, at, at which point my career was at crossroads. And it was just a chance meeting with Dr. Savita Ayer, uh, who uh, had come to NCBS uh, to set up the research development office that I switched my careers to research management and joined the research development office as a grants advisor. And I've steadily moved uh, across uh, to my current leadership uh, role in, within the RDO. I have 10 years of experience in research management. The Bangalore Life Science Cluster is a unique hub of excellence in biological research in India. It comprises of three institutions, the National Center for Biological Sciences, a center of a PIFR Mumbai, uh, Institute of Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine, which is an autonomous institute under the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and CCAM, the Center for Cellular and Molecular Platforms, which is a Section 8 company supported by various departments and ministries of the Government of India. Uh, together, these three organizations cover a range of research uh, in uh, life sciences from fundamental to translation to innovation. We are well resourced in terms of manpower for the size of our organization uh, of our combined cluster uh, campus and uh, we have a uh, state of the art scientific facilities and we have demonstrated our impact through publications, uh, through publications, patents and uh, the you know the life science products we have uh, uh, which are already in the market the presentation outline is as follows so you have the origin of the rdo concept the establishment and expansion of the rdo services impact and the challenges the rdo was set up in 2010 when the cluster campus was growing with the establishment of instem and ccamp in close proximity to ncds and was quickly realized 
that reliance solely on core funds was restrictive to the ambition of campus researchers and therefore there was a requirement for creation of a robust pipeline of competitive funding and also a mixed portfolio of funding was essential for the expansion of the research programs with this view with this in view the rdo or central office for the combined campus for creating and standardizing processes necessary for accessing funding initiatives and creating institutional memory was established and it was called the research development office to give a broader ambit than just grants the idea was established in phases the first five years of what we call the establishment and operational op operationalization phase of the idea in 2010 we established the idea with the initial focus on extramural funding uh, dr savita Ayur, the research management professional stayed trained at the welcome trust uk was recruited to lead these efforts in 2012, we initiated ex uh, efforts towards external liaison, and uh, in 2014, we initiated efforts towards philanthropic fundraising and expanded to include news. The next phase was a scaling up process where our major focus remained on grant fundraising and grant management. But in 2014 to 17, within the RDO, we initiated uh, scale and scaled up uh, efforts towards communications, and which has spawned a new office of communications. In 2014, again, we initiated our efforts towards philanthropic fundraising and award management, uh, and which has now spawned an Office of Resource Development and Planning Unit. Together, the three offices work synergistically to raise the funding and institutional profile of the cluster campus. As I said, the RDO services are focused on majorly on grant fundraising and grant management. We are a small group of four and we provide comprehensive services at uh, the pre-award and post-award stage to the campus researchers. Uh, Dr. Malini Pillai is the grants advisor and myself uh, a lead, take the lead on most of the pre-award services on campus. Ms. MC Aruna, who is the administrator on campus, is um, in our team, manages most of the reporting for routine grants. Dr. Roshan Kumar is a program manager for the large institutional program grants, which I will talk about in the next slide. We have also developed in-house uh, grants management system uh, to actually create in institutional memory of all the grants which are submitted from the campus. The large institutional programs are ambitious projects with multi-institutional flavor, uh, both commonly involving an international partner. And these large institutional programs were possible because we had already established a support structure of grant administrators on campus. There are a few examples of some of the large programs which are uh, currently uh, established within the campus. And monitoring and management of these large institutional grants requires a different level of support. A program manager is at the interface of several internal and external stakeholders and to manage efficiently the, uh, the grant the routine management of the grants. In addition, we also provide governance for large programs where required. Dr. Roshan Kumar, as I said, is the program manager who manages majority of the large institutional programs on campus. Uh, Dr. Arka Mitra Vishnu is a program manager recruited specifically for the chemical ecology program, which is a large multi-institutional program sponsored by the Department of Biotechnology. The development activities, the philanthropic fundraising and the management of philanthropic awards were efforts which were initiated in 2014 and have now transitioned to the resource development and planning unit in 2019 with the recruitment of two new support staff to scale up these efforts. We also manage agreements uh, related to funding and collaborations and are involved right from the drafting, negotiation, uh, execution uh, to the government of uh, um, India approvals were required. We facilitate collaborations via grants, research agreements, and also hosting international delegates wishing to uh, establish uh, collaborations with the researchers on campus. And here's a summary view of the international and national collaborations we have facilitated in the last five years. We have an active, uh, actively reach out to the campus researchers for information dissemination and capacity building. For example, we conduct these annual postdoctoral workshops. In the last two years since IRMI has been initiated, we have also been creating awareness about research management on campus. And here is a snapshot view on the right hand corner about the research administration day, administrator day that we celebrated. We actively seek feedback on RDO services from the researcher community to constantly upgrade and refine our services. The positive feedback that we get uh, actually uh, motivates the team to, uh, to constantly achieve a higher standards of services. 
we also reach out beyond the campus uh, uh, as resource persons for workshops on grant writing and grant funding, discussions on research management, and an active outreach program to funding agency to agencies to facilitate grant funding on campus. What is the impact of RDO on grant funding on campus? Uh, well, we have, as Katrina said, we have also developed a, a funding database, which is a first for India, and it's an open source. It's nationally well regarded and has about 100,000 visits since April 2019. We have established a strong centralized pipeline for campus grant submissions to local and international agencies and streamlined grant management and reporting. This has resulted in about a two-fold increase in grant submissions uh, uh, since the last five years and on an average three-fold increase in funds received uh, since uh, inception. We have aided in the establishment of large multi-institutional programs on campus, some of which are now national facilities. We have uh, aided in the procurement of funding to seek new directions of research, and we have boosted the campus postdoctoral program. More importantly, we have gained a goodwill in the community as uh, for the team as domain experts. We have also impacted the individual research programs of independent investigators by helping them expand their funding portfolio and leverage multiple streams of funding. We have also aided in the establishment of international collaborations via grants and agreements. Uh, we have been in, yeah, we have been in a position to influence policy change at the government level to allow foreign investigators working in India to apply for funding from GOI. This was important for the foreign faculty on campus. The private fundraising uh, efforts on campus have created awareness among the donor community about our cluster campus and research as a giving possibility. We have created endowment funds, intramural travel funding opportunities, supported joint postdoctoral programs, boosted the scope of the Government of India funded programs and expanded the science and society program. The challenges, uh, what I believe uh, in setting up an office like this, the first challenge is to have a buy-in from the institutional senior management, the gaining trust with the campus research community, working effectively across other internal teams, gaining trust with staff at funding agencies, and constantly demonstrating value addition. If I put it down into five points, scope and understand what is the requirements on campus, plan and develop processes to meet those requirements, and constantly reach out to the campus to get feedback in order to upgrade your services. What I feel are ongoing challenges are the lack of adequate peer group in India, which I believe uh, and hope that the IDME initiative is going to uh, address sustainability of research management offices and career development of research managers remains an ongoing challenge. With that, this is my last slide. I thank all the current and the previous team members who have made the team RDO what it is currently. We are on Twitter, so please do feel free to connect with us at Twitter at our Twitter handle RDO at plus one. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Benita, for your really nice presentation on the RDO at uh, the Bliss campus. So I think it's uh, time for us to take a couple of questions from the audience. There have been several questions streaming in. So Simon, I hope I can ask you to answer this question. So the question that uh, should IPR management cell of an institute, should that be a part of the research management office or should that be an independent one? Of course, there are different ways of looking at this. So it'd be nice to have your perspective on that. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I think there are three answers to that. One is yes, uh, the other is no, and the other is maybe. Um, it depends on the institution. So if I take Kent, for example, our IP management function um, is currently separate from the research office. Uh, 15 years ago, it was part of the research office. It was split out in order that those people looking after uh, IP uh, uh, patents and spin out companies and so on could focus on that and provide dedicated support to academic staff because it, it was felt that having that as a separate service raised the profile of it. Um, again, I'm, I'm not sure about the culture in India. In the UK, the culture is very much that uh, it's research and research, research, and anything else is a secondary consideration for academic staff. So they would, if they went to the research and enterprise office, 
they would be going with their research hat on. Um, if there's a separate enterprise office supporting IP support, then it, it kind of raises the profile. Having said that, uh, we are uh, coming together again and we'll have a research and innovation service uh, by the end of this year because universities like reorganizing. Um, I think it really depends on the strategic goals of the institution. So uh, the answer is, uh, like many questions in research management, it depends. Thank you so much, Simon. Katrina, I have another question for you from a member in the audience. Let me just read that out. Um, so clinical trials are different from other public health and basic health research in terms of regulation, study designs, GCP approvals, etc. How easy or difficult was it for you, Katrina, to expand your experience to clinical trials? Did you have to take any special course? It's a really good question because clinical trial research management and just health research management are different and clinical trials do have specialist, specialised considerations that need to be that need to be considered. Actually, I started out in clinical trials. Uh, my first major research project that I worked on in, as a grant support role was uh, growing up in New Zealand study, which is a longitudinal study following a birth cohort of children for their entire lives. Um, and it was a massive, massive undertaking to get that set up and started. Um, so great experience starting out in clinical trials research. To be honest, when I started working in research management, no, I didn't go to a special clinical trials course. I hung around with other people who had done it before. I talked a lot with the researchers. I used some of my philosophy training in ethics um, and stuff like that. So, but I think that if you, if it was now, I think that there's actually quite a lot of more options for people to learn things like GCP um, and work with um, clinical trials institutions and specific clinical trials training courses. Um, one thing I would say though is it's, I think it's important not to muddy too much the waters between grants management and the grants aspects of managing a clinical trial and clinical trial management itself, which is more around, you know, getting the ethics approvals, um, doing the GCP, making sure that, you know, the monitoring and all the clinical trials monitoring, all that kind of stuff. So some of those are very specialist clinical trial management skills. They're not the same thing in my point of view as the grant itself. So when I work in clinical trials, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the contract, I'm looking at the costing and pricing, I'm looking at um, some of the elements of the risk, though not all, because some of that I'll defer to the clinical staff to do the risk analysis for. Um, and, and so you have to work in collaboration with your clinically trained staff, as well as with the grant staff and possibly with the finance staff and all the other departments that actually have a stake um, in that research project to get the right fit. Thank you, Katrina. Um, Vinita, we have a question for you. Uh, could you please explain a bit more about how the audio has boosted the postdoc community? Okay, well, uh, I'd rather not speak too much about it because my colleague Marley will be talking about the pre-award services and what we have done for the postdoc community. But uh, in brief, uh, we have worked very closely with the academic office uh, to set up a pre-screening mechanism in which uh, you know the, there is a committee which is uh, you know, made up of uh, scientists on campus uh, and uh, we screen the applications for uh, the competitive uh, postdoctoral programs and they, the postdocs get feedback so that increases the quality of the uh, quality of the uh, you know the application that goes on we have as i mentioned also uh, created uh, these joint postdoctoral program opportunities uh, where we have been involved with uh, collaborations with the international organizations overseas uh, and uh, we've helped uh, get uh, you know, funding for those kind of uh, initiatives and we have been helped we have helped the academic office streamline the process of managing those kind of programs so these are just a few of the examples of how we have boosted the postdoctoral program on campus thank you vinita simon we have a question about uh, training so the question is, if a postdoctoral researcher wants to become a research manager, what would you recommend them to do during their postdoc days for learning soft skills? 
Wow, that's a great question. Um, yeah, okay, so soft skills. There are um, a, a whole load of, in the UK, um, uh, transferable skills uh, development courses. So uh, we have a, an organization called VTI, which is particularly, sorry, the UK has an organization called VTI, which is particularly set up for um, what is it um, that researchers might want to do next? Because about 10 or 12% of researchers become academic staff. Most of them go on to do other things. Um, and as you rightly pointed out, research management is one of those. So, so the soft skills, it really is take any and every opportunity to get out of your comfort zone. So if there's something that you don't particularly like doing, so as a researcher, maybe you don't like giving presentations or uh, maybe you don't like um, speaking to the public or you know, whatever it might be, then just try and, try and stretch yourself a, a little bit. Um, you'll probably find there's a lot of internal uh, opportunities, but, but also think about those external things that you might do as well. So I guess always try and do more. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? Don't do more, just do different things. That would be my advice. Thank you, Simon. And I think Vinita, perhaps at uh, the audio uh, at the Bliss campus, you, I, I believe you have a steady stream of postdocs who come by and ask you similar questions. So would you like to share some thoughts there? Well, we do, uh, that is true. And uh, that's also the reason why we conduct the uh, postdoc uh, workshops annually. And uh, going by the, you know, the pre and the uh, post uh, workshop uh, survey, most of the time we people have, uh, the postdocs have come back to us and said that we need to know what are the kinds of, you know, research management roles that we can go into. Now, here we are talking about not only about research management, there are several careers in science, so we do incorporate a, a session on careers in science in general. My, my advice to the postdoc seeking a change, like Simon said, try something different. There are several fields which make up the research management. What is it that, uh, that actually interests you? And try and figure out ways to train yourself in those fields. That's my advice. Thank you, Vinita. Um, so Madhuri, we have, uh, sorry, um, Katrina, I beg your pardon, you have a question about uh, how does one go about setting up a research office in a hospital setting? <laughs> um, so are, are research offices just for universities, institutions, or can they actually work in a hospital setting as well? I mean, full disclosure, I've always worked in a university setting, um, but I've also often most of my career also worked in, in a hospital setting. So I think there are some differences for if you're just a hospital research department and you want to set up your research office for your hospital. And the main difference there will be that you might need to think quite carefully about um, how you do publications and, and maybe get some additional training on things like intellectual property management because universities, um, have a lot more experience in those areas, I think, than hospitals. Um, but I've always worked in hospitals. So at the moment, I go to work every day on the campus of the Hospital of Tropical Diseases. And we were our university office that works in partnership with the hospital. So, and I think that that model of partnership works really well, where we're embedded in the hospital environment. Uh, the hospital staff and the research staff and the university staff are often there are people in dual roles where we're sharing space together we're sharing we're communicating all the time and that that model of sort of shared responsibility is something that's really really important i think in any hospital situation the researchers are, are likely to be clinical staff as well as hospital staff um, and so there needs to be sort of flexibility and understanding around the different pressures in that environment as opposed to a very fixed research office in a university environment. Thank you so much, Katrina. Um, we have a question here. Are there workshops being held in cities like Pune for students? Um, well, at this point, it's a little bit difficult uh, for anybody to be conducting in-person workshops, but the good part of that is that there are actually a lot of online resources available. So if students are interested in training, um, you'd be advised to look around, see what online resources there are, which fit the kind of training you might be looking for. Um, And 
Okay, so hmm. I'm going to pose this question to all three of you. Are there examples where people revert to academia after working in research management? Well, you see, Simon abhors a silence, so I'll jump straight in. Uh, yes, there are. Um, so, uh, I mean, I have um, a number of staff who've, who've worked for me who have done PhDs while they have been. Um, so that, that's sort of reverting to. Uh, but yes, I mean, there, um, there are a number of people who have been research managers and then have moved back into academia. I, not that many. Uh, I can think of probably three or four examples in the UK. I, w I won't to name them just to just in case they don't want to be named um, but I mean why would you want to because research management is the best job in the world <laughs> well I can add to that and say that I do know of a couple of uh, people who have moved from research management uh, back into research one of my former colleagues had uh, taken that step as well so uh, i guess it depends on what uh, your interest lies in uh, it could be possible that you've you know, taken a jump into research management just to see whether you know you you are a good fit and you when you realize you probably are not you move back to uh, to academia and i see no reason why that should be distressing on both sides thank you so uh, from, from my perspective, um, I find <laughs> for me, I kind of end up dabbling in quite a few academic things my own now and then. Um, one of the things for me that I think happens in research management, at least for me, is that I come up with academic questions. Now I'm not an academic still, but um, you know, I have a couple of grants um, and oversee a small research project around policy engagement for researchers, for example, because there are certain things that happen in the course of research management that inspire academic questions. I have a project that I've wanted to do, didn't actually do, um, around plagiarism and how, you know, how the funders internationally address plagiarism, what kind of ways are they detecting or, or judging whether or not plagiarism is taking place in research proposals, for example. And that is quite an academic question. So I think that what can happen, depending on your personality, is that particularly if you're already an academic and you've taken up research management, doing your research management work can inspire you to actually continue with your academic career. Thank you. Simon, maybe I could just quickly ask you a related question, which is about publishing in research management. And it is a scholarly activity. Would you like to share some thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, quite a lot of research managers publish in professional magazines, if you like. Um, so most of the larger associations um, have them. But in terms of actual sort of academic publishing, um, there are two or potentially three journals uh, which are specifically for research management, research administration. So there is uh, the Journal of Research Administration, which is associated with the Society of Research Administrators in the US. Uh, um, there is also the Research Management Review, which is associated with the other large US association, the National Council of University Research Administrators uh, in Cura. Um, and as you've asked, I would mention the Journal of Research Management and Administration, uh, which um, is perhaps um, I like to think broader scope, and I say I like to think that because I'm one of the editors. Um, the first uh, edition is going to be due out in August or September, so um, we're hoping that perhaps lots of people listening to this might write something for us. Uh, Jorma is what you need to look for. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. And Katrina, you've, you've got something similar going in Malaysia um, and sort of Southeast Asia more generally. Would you like to mention that? Yeah, so the University of Malaysia um, established a Journal of Research Management and Governance in 2017, I think they started. They've had one issue already, and um, that first issue, I think most of the articles were based on Malaysian research, but their aim is to is to publish research management um, research that's focused on Southeast Asia, not specifically, but I think that they really want to focus on Southeast Asia and other low middle income country environments, rather because I think some of the other journals that have been mentioned have a very northern focus. 
Um, I think the second edition will be coming out in December this year. Yes. Um, so we have a question about motivation. So the question is about motivating research managers at par with research scientists in India, but I think it's a broader question as well. But uh, Vinita, maybe you could just say a few words because the original question is about motivating research managers in India. Well, I think uh, uh, I don't have a specific comment on the motivation. I think it is a very uh, specific to the role that you play. Uh, but if I can speak as a research manager overseeing a team of four, uh, I would say that uh, motivation comes uh, by leading by example. And I think uh, if uh, you want a certain amount, a certain kind of service to be performed or a certain standard of service to be attained, you lead by example. I think that's what I mean about motivating by my, myself my, and my team. Uh, generally about motivation, uh, I think it comes from your research, uh, from your interest. So if you are not interested in what you do, no matter how hard you try, you cannot be motivated. But if you have, if you are in a job or in a field which is of your interest, uh, which uh, you know uh, catches your attention, which is something that you're passionate about, motivation comes from within. Thank you, Vinita. I think we are now nearing the end of our uh, time for today's webinar. So we are just like to request the speakers to leave a few thoughts um, on you know, their advice to institutions building their research offices. So for example, we have had a question, how does one set up an OUCRU in Odisha in India? <laughs> so it is a journey. There are many steps involved and many people involved. And if you would just take turns to share your final thoughts with the listeners. That would be great. What would your advice be? Katrina, maybe. Okay, I will go first. Um, I think for me, um, my advice for a, a university or institution that's considering setting up a research office, um, please do it. It will only increase the quality of your research ultimately because um, by having some skilled research administration support on board, on site, um, at your fingertips, then you are more likely to you know, free up the time for your researchers to actually do the thing that they're good at, which is the research itself. Thank you, Katrina. And Vinita, what would you like to say? Well, I would like to say that yes, uh, there is uh, a research office like this does bring value to the institution, but it's not a glove fits all sort of thing. The requirements of each of the institutions, universities, hospitals, engineering colleges, they are all very different. And if you have to set up a research office in your uh, organization, I would say that you have to figure out what are the requirements of the organization. And that would be the first step in setting up a research office like this to find out what is it that the community of your organization requires before you bring out processes and you know uh, uh, things to actually establish so i think it is very requirement specific thank you Benita. and simon some words of wisdom about setting up some, offices yeah words of wisdom I'm not sure about that I, of course I, I agree with everything that katrina and Benita said um uh, there are about 150 universities in the uk and there are about 450 models of how to set up research support. Uh, each university has the way in which they do it. Uh, they have the way in which they think they do it and they have the way in which they would like to do it. Um, and the reason why it's 450 is because they're all different because as Vinita says, you have to tailor it to what your institution wants to do. In terms of the most important things, getting that senior buy-in to start with, you need to have uh, an advocate, ideally the vice chancellor or president, but at the very least, um, the deputy vice chancellor for research and innovation or whatever. And that needs to be a, a strong person. They also need to have uh, the financial support uh, because a research office doesn't cost nothing to run. You can very easily show how much value it adds to the institution, but it's not gonna add that value 
uh, for about two years at the earliest because you you need to start doing the development of the training and then get the, the higher quality proposals and then they need to be funded and you know, the income isn't going to start until two years or probably three years later um, so you need to have that that, that patience um, and what you do have in India now are some really good models of uh, yes uh, this is how we've done it and we can show you what we are doing now compared with what we did before um, and I think the, the example that, that Vanitha gave, uh, gave was uh, the three times the research income. Um, if you tell your president um, that one way of getting three times the current research income that you have is to do this, they'll probably be quite keen to support you. Thank you very much and uh, on that note I just join all our listeners in thanking our three wonderful speakers today for a great session. Um, and to all our listeners, thank you for joining in today. Um, please do take some time to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar session. And I'd also like to say that this is the first edition in this brand new series, which is focused on research management. So if you've benefited from listening to the webinar today, please do join us for all the future editions as well. Information about the future editions will be communicated through the India Alliance communication channels. And you can always follow information on Ernie Ibrat, the India Alliance website, or through their social media channels. And if you're tweeting about the webinars today, please use the um, hashtag Ernie or hashtag Ernie webinars. And thank you so much for everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.